Good afternoon, folks. Welcome. Actually, welcome to Global Entrepreneurship Week. Let's give a hand for Global Entrepreneurship Week. First of all, on behalf of President Rondeau and our board of directors here, welcome to the College of DuPage also. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Global Entrepreneurship Week is actually a worldwide event, 160 countries, 35,000 events. We just happen to have a few of them here on campus, and I truly, truly appreciate it. I can't thank you enough for being here as well. So welcome. We have a distinguished panel today of entrepreneurs, and I, I just want to dive right in and, 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 and talk to them and give you guys the opportunities to ask questions about what they do, how they've done it, and share their experiences for your benefit, for our benefit as a whole. So without further ado, let's welcome Dino, Tom, Jim, Jackie, and Angela. Let's give them a hand, first of all. So we're going to go ladies first and ask them all to give a two-minute overview of their business to begin. So Angela, without further ado. Good afternoon. Nothing creates anxiety like having to go. <laughs> My name is Angela Brathwaite, and I am the inventor of Road Trip Potty, which is a portable female urinal that fits discreetly underneath the passenger car seat. It holds about 19 ounces of liquid. It has a spout for voiding. It is heat resistant, leak resistant, and splash resistant. And we have been available with the product on sale um, here in the United States since about mid-July. Sales have been phenomenal, but even more so has the public's understanding of why there is a, such a need for this particular product. We also offer a car seat cover and a discretion blanket. I'd like to thank you for having me here today. I'd like to thank you for um, understanding that the path to entrepreneurship is not a direct linear path. My background started in education. Um, and I am still an educator. However, <clears throat> my heart now is truly with the entrepreneurial spirit, being an entrepreneur, and embracing all elements of it. Thank you so much, Angela. Let's give her a hand. Yeah. Jackie, welcome. Please. Thank you. I oftentimes get asked what I do. And uh, at the core of what I do is uh, I am a servant inspired leader. And uh, with that, I have an urgency to serve the community. I do that by a couple of businesses. I started my first business when I was 23, just celebrated 11 years uh, with a marketing, full service marketing PR agency, award-winning marketing agency, thank you. <laughs> and, um, and because of that desire to serve, I've uh, created a nonprofit organization for young Latinas, and I always say I have 57 daughters, mm -hmm. so it's a very exciting uh, time in, on top of my two children. And uh, in 2010, I became an author. I wrote my first business book, and little did I know that that was going to launch me into this international path to speak, to share, and uh, next week I'll be finishing up my 10th book. So, um, you know, uh, entrepreneurship has allowed me uh, that dream of a little girl. In fact, uh, somebody here from College of the Page gave me, tapped me on the shoulder from SCORE and said, you're ready to start your business mm -hmm. when I was 23, when everybody else was saying, you can't do that. You're a young Latina. You're, you know, what are you going to do? And uh, so I have a, you know, gratitude. And of course, I'm a graduate of College of the Page as well. So um, that's, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an innovator, marketer, uh, creator of a lot of different things that end up being worldly, <laughs> worldwide, unbeknownst to me many times. Um, and I just continue to create as much magic as I can. Let's give Jackie a hand. <laughs> Well, I think we're going to see Angela on Shark Tank. You know, she's very <laughs> impressive. Uh, my name is Jim Elliott. I'm the founder and president of a nonprofit called Dive Heart. And we help children, adults, and veterans with disabilities build confidence, independence, and self esteem. And we do it in zero gravity, we do it underwater. So instead of becoming an astronaut, we help individuals with disabilities become aquanauts. And I'm a graduate from College of DuPage as well and actually learned to scuba dive here because I, I was a journalism major and I thought, you know, if I ever meet someone like Jacques Cousteau, how many people know who Jacques Cousteau is? Okay, a few. 
I thought, if I meet Jacques Cousteau, I better know how to scuba dive, right? So I took scuba diving, and Al Zamsky, who had came last year to uh, an event that I was at here at College of DuPage, uh, taught me how to dive. And kind of got away from it. You know, you raise a family, you get involved in life and stuff like that. And uh, was, went from here to Northern Illinois University, got recruited out of Northern by the Chicago Tribune. Then I went to WGN Radio, and I helped start up CLTV News here in town. After having a father with a disability who was an Army vet and then raising four kids with disabilities, guiding and teaching blind skiers since the mid-'80s, I've been around this a while. So I thought, you know, if skiing can turn people's lives around, because my daughter's blind, I got her into skiing. It turned her whole life around. I thought, what about scuba diving, right? <clears throat> so I, I left the six-figure income. I don't draw a salary. Anything, any money I make from teaching, I teach instructors all over the world, I donate back to Dive Heart. And I, I, I thought, if we can get people, mainly physically impaired people, out of wheelchairs and get them in the water, it'll change their lives, right? building this confidence, independence, and self-esteem. Now, we're doing research with university medical centers around the world, uh, finding out that if you go deep enough, there's an extra output of serotonin, which helps with pain management and anxiety. Pressure's a therapy for kids with autism, right? So if we get kids underwater, there's, it's ambient pressure around them. We've had kids at, like Wabansi High School in, in, in Aurora that I thought was nonverbal. Kids going, oh, teachers going, listen, if you want to do this with Dive Heart, you better chill out. Right, So we, I, I'm like, don't give this kid fins. He's going to take off on us underwater, right? So we got him underwater. He completely drained the scuba tank, stood up, and said, you know, I really enjoyed that. I think I'd like to try it again. And we went, <laughs> oh, my God, this is a kid we thought was nonverbal. But when it comes to autism, pain management, PTSD symptoms, we're finding that zero gravity, therapy and zero gravity, is the next big thing. So we're trying to build the deepest warm water therapy pool in the world. We'd love to do it on the College of DuPage campus, but up till now, no one's helped us do that. But maybe, maybe after today, that'll change. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, <laughs> but we are talking to the city of Aurora, the second largest city in Illinois. So if you know anybody who knows anybody who wants to be part of a multi-million dollar program to build the deepest warm water therapy pool in the world to replicate in, in a confined water setting what we can do in open water, have them call me. That's amazing. That's awesome. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Man. Tom. Some tough acts here, man. These are great. Uh, I'm Tom from Dom and Tom. Uh, I have a twin brother named Dominic. Uh, we run a digital agency. Uh, we have offices in New York, Chicago, and LA. We're an Inc. Uh, sorry, an Inc. Uh, Inc. 500, 5,000 fastest growing company. We've been that uh, for four years in a row. We uh, do digital products and cutting edge technologies. Uh, we've done the Priceline.com app. We've done Turner Broadcasting apps. We've done Bloomberg. Uh, McDonald's, every other uh, Fortune 500 brand you can think of, we built it. And Dominic and I did it from a uh, from an apartment uh, several years ago when we were uh, in our 20s, just graduated from college. Uh, we lived out in Villa Park here, grew up here uh, all of our lives. Uh, Dominic went to college at Loyola. Um, and we really believe in the motto of do good, be good. Uh, you must do in order to be. So in order, if you want to be good, you have to do it. Uh, we've lived our motto that way. We've treated our clients that way. We've treated our uh, the people who have decided to work with us in that way. And we're proud to say that we've hired uh, several people from uh, College of DuPage and also around this neighborhood from uh, Lumbar to Glen Ellen uh, to uh, Wheaton and Elmhurst as well. And they've been part of the community that's been growing with us. And uh, right now, uh, we're excited to be a part of the community as we are. And we're, fast. We're again, going to be another fast-growing company. We're going to be uh, in our fifth year of fast growth. And uh, that's us. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm Dino Scatos. Um, I feel like I should actually be sitting over there <laughs> listening to all these folks because they're. Uh, I'm, I'm at the other end of the spectrum. I just retired from the Air Force after a little over 20 years in August and just started my own logistics company trying to focus in on distribution and pursuing government contracts. I'm literally learning as I go. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work with the uh, Small Business Development Center over, in the, uh, over on Warrenville Road at the, Lyle, uh, yeah. at, at, at the Lyle office. And it's been just a fire hose. Uh, I thought I, I, I knew a couple things, and every day I realize I don't know so much more. And uh, one thing I'd like to just make sure you guys take away, you're going to be a lifelong learner. <laughs> there, there is no end. Uh, and so I'm looking to start, uh, like I said, distributing specifically with a focus on the aerospace side of the house. That's where my expertise lies. Uh, but eventually I'd like to see if I can get myself to a point where I can get into the manufacturing side of the house.
Thank Happy you so to be here. Thank yes. you. Before we start the question round, we actually have a couple of other entrepreneurs in the audience. So I, I definitely two of them, and we have one at the end, and we're going to have talk at the end a little bit. So first, I just want to give a name and maybe your business. Sir, you look familiar. My name is Bill Crawford. I own Rainmaker Internet Marketing in downtown Wheaton. Thank you, Bill, for being here. Small. Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Jamal. I'm a co-founder of a tech company, ClearMace Technologies. And we're just a ed tech startup company, and we help build dynamic and tailored transfer guides for community colleges in Illinois as well as around the nation. Thank you so much, Jamal. Let's give these, both these gentlemen a hand as well. We also have another distinguished gentleman. I'm going to actually ask, ask him to reserve his comments until the end because he's got some special comments for the benefit of the audience as well. So this is how the format's going to go today for the next 45, to, to an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. This is for you. This is for you to ask questions of our distinguished panel here. Sure, I have my list of questions, but don't let me go because I'll talk all day. So what I'm asking is the audience, you know, I'm going to lead it off with a couple of questions. But as questions arise that you think of, this is not the time to be bashful because this is going to only benefit you and our community for sure. So that's why we're kind of filming it so that the community as well as our students here on campus can really understand what it takes to really get started. So without further ado, my first question for whoever wants to ask, answer it. Students come up to me all the time and say, Professor James, how do I get started? What do I do? So I want to throw the question at you. What did that look like when you were thinking about getting started and you finally made that leap? What, was this, what were the circumstances surrounding that? If you could uh, let us know that. Whoever wants to go first. I'll jump in there. Please. Uh, so we started, Dominic and I started 2008, uh, right in the middle of the financial crisis, right when everything was going to, to seed. And, uh, but what people don't realize or remember was that in 2007, end of 2007, was when the iPhone first came out. And so no one was an expert of iPhone development. There literally were no one, like no one was out there to say, I'm an expert of iPhone development. No one had been doing it. So Dominic and I said, let's quit our jobs, which is a horrible idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was tragic. And we were 26, 27 years old, decided to move in together, which none of our girlfriends enjoyed. And uh, we, we created a company. And the thing about it was Dominic was very good at programming. I was very good at marketing. And um, Dominic taught himself how to build three or four products. And we put up flyers all over uh, you know, the neighborhood uh, in, in Manhattan. I mean, this, we were in New Manhattan at the time. We'd moved out to New York. And um, we got uh, Prudential Insurance, Hearst uh, Publications, and a couple other uh, local brands to come and join us on, on our app development. And uh, we, we displayed expertise, we won some awards, um, and became consultants. And I'm proud to say that some of those guys are our clients today. But really was going back to, I mean, Dominic was making, my brother Dominic was making like, like you said, six-figure uh, salary. I was making close to a six-figure salary. We went from that to making $18,000 in one year and, and you know, basically splitting sandwiches together. And it was fun. It was fine. It wasn't like we look back and say, those were great days, but we were like, oh, you did what you had to do because you had a passion for it. It had to have been scary. It was, but I'm sure these guys have similar stories to that. I mean, you must have something to like. Yeah, I, uh, well. I laid in bed two days after I quit my media job, and I looked <laughs> at the ceiling and went, what the hell did you do? And um, then, then I just remember I, I put one foot in front of the other and, and do what you know how to do. You exactly. know what I mean? It's like I remember my dad had a, a, like a heart attack when I was at WGN Radio, and at that same year, they cut our commission like 75%, right? Oh. I was in the marketing and advertising side. And I, I was trying to explain to my ex that I'm not going to make the same amount of money we did last year. So you're going to have to kind of live within the budget. And she didn't quite get that, right? Yeah. Uh, which is, <laughs> anyway, long story short, short is I started getting chest pains because I was, I was stressing, and I had no idea. And I went to the doctor, and I did all the stress tests and everything. They go, you're as healthy as a horse, man. They go, it's probably stress. And I just went, oh my god. You know? And what I did is then, I put one foot in front of it. I go, you know what? I'm going to put on the blinders and work hard. Mm -hmm. Somebody said once, 90% of success is showing up. Mm -hmm. So mornings that I don't want to get out of bed, I just go, you know what? 90% of success <laughs> is showing up. Just show up. Yeah. Something good will happen. And, and, 
And really, it does. I mean, something sparks you, and that day then turns into a good day. And you take lemons, and you make lemonade. And just like today, we were robbed last night, believe it or not. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, Dive Heart was robbed. Yeah, we're in Downers Grove, and people broke into the building, robbed our place, and then, and then robbed the people on the second floor. And I'm trying to figure out how to spin that <laughs> you know, into something positive. I know, I know we got insurance, but you know, I see a social media post that says, hey, who would rob a charity, right? Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, and, and we've had our logo stolen, and, and we've turned around, and, and I've called the publisher and said, hey, well, you know, that's a copywritten logo. Now, are your logos copywritten? Oh, yeah, of course they are with the magazine. I said, well, you know, so are ours. Here's what we do. And I, I would buttonhole the publisher of this, this magazine for, for an hour. And next thing I know, we get 15 pages of editorial that year in this magazine. So there's, there's what, you know, if you can just identify those opportunities, they come to you every day. Yeah. For me, I mean, I started with a laptop that my boyfriend at the time gave me, mm -hmm. it's, uh, and I just had a lot of energy, and a disclaimer, I just had a coffee at uh, Starbucks, so <laughs> I'm extra energetic, you know, but uh, for me, um, I feel like I had been preparing to be an entrepreneur my whole life, unbeknownst to me, reading all kinds of books, and uh, I came to the, you know, to the States when I was 14, didn't speak a word, and of course, you know, people think, you know, you're a young Latina, you just came to the States, you didn't even speak a word of English when you came, and now you're gonna open up a communications agency? Like, hello, <laughs> like you're crazy, right? Um, but unfortunately, you know, for me, I, um, I was diagnosed with cancer when I was 21, shook my world. Um, I ended up getting married to the guy that gave me the laptop, and coincidentally, um, he, uh, he started really believing in, you know, I started the company when I was 23, um, and I went to my first client, and he, he just started really believing, and you know, this could be a business. Uh, he ended up leaving his job, and uh, now my husband uh, has been the creative director for the marketing agency for 10 years. Um, but what's interesting is that you know, when I was 23, and as I go to this Indian restaurant, and I'm super excited, it's my first client. I had just given birth to my first baby, and uh, because of the cancer that I had, they told me that I was probably not gonna be able to have children, so I was high risk and uh, show up to this place, and um, as I'm leaving, I mean, I've never had Indian food in my life, and as I'm leaving this restaurant, I noticed they had these little containers with spices, and I said, what are they? Well, these are spices to clean your palate after a meal. I said, who wouldn't like to do that, right? <laughs> so I grabbed one, and my life changed. I had no idea that I was gonna end up in the hospital. Two weeks, 40 doctors, had no clue what I had, finally discovered that I was born with a condition that happens in one out of 150,000 people around the this part of the world. And uh, it was type two, which is 3% of the cases found. So as I'm sitting in the hospital, I'm thinking, okay, finally I have an opportunity to start a business in the land of opportunity. I have a baby, I have an amazing husband that supports me, and I'm here in a hospital at Northwestern hooked up to every tube you can think of mm -hmm. and fighting for my life. And I remember Dr. walked in and said, you're very lucky to be alive, you know, because we found that that cyst that you were born with was pre-cancer level four. And it was right by my liver where I, it would have basically been a time bomb and I would have died without even knowing why. And they found that they reconstructed my entire digestive system. I get out of the hospital with a tube and, and a bag. And the first thing I, to, I told the doctor when he said those news, I said, doctor, I just have one question. Because my desire to be an entrepreneur in this country was so, it was bigger than life. And I said to him, you know what? I just have one question. Can I get out by next Thursday? Because I have finals at College of the Page, and I'm going to graduate with honors. And so I came in, and nobody knew that a week and a half, two weeks before that, I had, was fighting for my life. I actually had a big jacket because I had the bag that was coming out of my, you know, from this very difficult surgery. Um, nobody knew. I just showed up. I got my head in the game, I completed that, I graduated with honors, and that journey has now been almost 12 years. We've gotten all kinds of awards, I've gotten all kinds of awards here in the Chicagoland area, and we continue to help you know, small to mid-sized and Fortune 500 companies. So you know what? Sometimes adversities help you propel you and help you get you to, like, today, the beginning of something amazing. Wow, well, good stuff. Angela. Sometimes you do have those adversities where you are in a position where you, you don't have a choice. But for those of you who do have a choice, make sure you understand your why. 
why do you want to become an entrepreneur mm -hmm. versus why not go and work for someone else? And your reason for choosing to become an entrepreneur is very important because that reason, whatever it is, is going to be the thing that will help you to get up in the mornings when you've had a very long night because you've had to do something for your business, something for your idea. And you may have meetings in the next morning. If you don't know why you're doing this, it may be a little bit easy to kind of blow off the meeting because, you know, it's just a meeting. But if you understand your why, what your passion is, what your commitment is to this idea of entrepreneurship, <clears throat> then that will promote you, pro propel you to put in that extra effort so you can be successful. It will help you to keep moving and churning so that you will reach your goal, whatever it is. Most people think that the why is somehow related to finances. Finances help, but whatever your why is, it has to be that thing that makes you feel good because you've done it. Good stuff. Dino, we didn't give you a chance. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I, well said. Um, I, I actually was in a similar predicament in terms of the why. Uh, I had actually gotten promoted. Uh, I could have done 10 more years. And I had made uh, some family decisions saying, you know what, I, I don't want to deploy it anymore. I don't want the family separation. A lot of the stuff that, that kind of comes with it. It was a good life, don't, don't get me wrong. But there certain things I'm like, you know, and it came down to the uh, comfort level. Um, and you got to get out of that comfort level because I was set for the next 10 years. I knew what I was doing. Uh, that, that, that had financial security, medical benefit, I mean, all of it. And you just kind of go, I'd like to go work for myself. I'd like to be in charge. And I don't want there to be a limit. So for me, going, getting out and working for somebody else meant, okay, I'm still working for somebody else, but I'm still going to have a cap. You know, you can go work for any, any major company unless you're the CEO or president, work your way up. You know, you're, you're, you're getting a salary and you're working. I was like, no, I want, I want something a little bit more for myself. So I had a little bit of that hunger. Um, and I'll tell you, it was definitely, uh, you know, my wife and I were a little bit on the, you know, because you've know, got three kids and, and so you, you, you have to think about this sort of thing. But you're like, you know what? We're okay. We can do this. And if we don't do it now, when are, when are we going to do it? Um, because it's, it's, it's about getting out of that comfort zone. Good stuff. Very, very good. A lot of adversity I'm hearing in these stories as well. And here's the adversity is not always at the very beginning. The adversity is along the road. So it's never a smooth path to where, the path to where you are right now. Questions from the audience. Anybody's got questions, for individual questions, specific questions, questions about how it may relate to your business or your idea. Yes, sir, in the back with the handsome shirt there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. We're, we're going to bring a mic there for you, sir. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not a good arm. <laughs> good afternoon. Great stories already. Really good information. My question is for everybody. <clears throat> Financing. We've had some experience with financing, whether it be banks or private individuals looking to raise money for your business. Whoever wants to tackle I that can, first. Uh, <clears throat> I can say that as a nonprofit, uh, we like to have everything donated. So if any of you would like to make a donation, <laughs> I have lots of donation letters here. No. But seriously, um, I went to a, a friend who was an attorney and, and said, you know, I have this idea for this heart. I've been doing this blind ski stuff, and I want to do it with diving and underwater. And, you know, I don't even know if this mark is available. And this guy, it was Schiff Harden, our law firm, ends up doing the 501c3 work pro bono and all our trade work pro bono. So as a nonprofit, I'm always asking. And if you don't ask, you don't get, right? So I think that's important. And uh, from that perspective, I, I don't like to be in debt, <clears throat> and we're not in debt. I've been black. Mm -hmm. since we since we started and part of it is I don't draw a salary so you know die far probably couldn't afford to pay me but um, but leveraging resources is really important I learned to do it in the media business uh, with WGN radio I would use on-air merchandising as opposed to you know selling spots or a combination thereof and it was um, and, and it was a way to give add value to my you know, to, to my sponsors when I was in the media business. But now what we do is we're able to, you know, like Bill Kay, our car dealer here in town, maintains all our vehicles for free. You know, so, you know, it's easier to ask a lawyer 
to give you pro bono legal services than it is to ask them for a $10,000 check, right? So that was kind of, from a nonprofit perspective, that's kind of how we, you know, so we're a $350,000 budget, that's our budget, and we act more like a three or four million dollar charity. And, and it's not where we're gonna go, but it's how we got going. Good stuff. Somebody else on finances? Uh, I mean, I started with computers uh, at, our, at our table. I mean, there was no finances. And I, I think there's a value in actually, you guys could probably you know, think about this as well or speak on this better than I can. Uh, there's a value in not getting any kind of credit card debt or any kind of financing at all. Like, do it yourself for as long as you can without any other person throwing any kind of money into, it, into the mix. Because um, you get disciplined. Uh, you, you learn a certain amount of discipline without actually going out for financing. Uh, you know, I, I run a $15 million business right now. Um, and we went as long as we could without ever having to get a relationship with a bank. Um, and we were very proud of being able to do that. And we were able to get Fortune 500 companies. 85% of our pro portfolios are, 45, are for, Fortune 500 companies. Um, I'm working right now with a, co a couple entrepreneurs. Uh, one of them is 17 years old. Uh, he's doing his first app right now. Um, Got a good idea. He's a senior in high school, and uh, his question to me was, "How much do I raise?" And I said, "None. You don't raise anything until you actually have an idea that you feel confident about. You you've, you've stuck with it, and God bless it. You're 17 years old. You got to have some life milestones. You may change. You may decide you don't want to do it anymore. Why get into debt for something you might change your mind on? You know, 10 years down the line, you're going to learn a lot. So that's my encouragement. But if you do want to get financing, and if you need that kind of money, if you do have a pro product." First of all, I would say never do services in financing. I don't think that's a way to go. Uh, services has been around for tens of thousands of years. Literally, trading expertise for, for dollars has been around since Babylonian times. You don't need to do that. So if you're running a marketing agency, if you're running a, a law firm or a plumbing service, that is just expertise for dollars. I mean, that's, that's simple. There's no money you need to raise for that. You just go out there, print up some flyers, and just go, go to work. Um, if you're doing a product, and you want to get, you want to build, and you probably speak this better than I can. I mean, start start doing some manufacturing and some prototyping. Maybe do something like that, but do paper and pen prototyping before you ever do anything like physical prototyping. I mean, you want. To... If you can get some seed money, uh, I'm starting off small uh, because I, I don't have the I, I don't have the capital to start big. So I'm going after small government contracts because believe it or not, there's actually a niche there because a lot of them are. Uh, from $500 to $150,000. Mm -hmm. And so if there are small ones in there, I, I, I'm okay getting a bunch of nickels and dimes and not going after the, the, all the dollars because initially that's what I can do. And so I can absorb that internally at least for a little while. And that's, that's why I'm saying that timing of where, where's your comfort zone. So we can button down right now and I can start off small. Um, getting a line of equity or getting investors uh, there's there's pros and cons, so that's something. Honestly, you might want to actually talk to. I, I would talk to different folks that have done that. I, I have I've tried to hold off on, on, uh, taking any loans out, and trying to do some of that stuff internally. Now, if you have a large product, or you need a lot of inventory, that's a different story. Or uh, and everything from like virtual office space. Like if you need an office space, you can actually rent office space, very very cheaply. So there's different. Uh, techniques again. I actually learned that from the from 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 uh, from the Lyle uh, location. I didn't even know about virtual office until they mentioned it to me. I'm like, what's virtual office? And you start looking it up, and you're like, oh, I can get an office with an address and a phone service for like 100 bucks a month. You know, as opposed to going in rent. You know, you know what rent prices are around here. So there's there's definitely things that are out there that you can look to how to be uh, just very fiscally uh, prudent and, and where you're going to go. But if you do need uh, capital, you can pursue lines of credit. Uh, you can actually go through even uh, some of the small business development centers and, and, and see if you can, they'll help you uh, pursue loans, business loans if you need them. As a service-based uh, business, I also started with a laptop and um, did my own logo, did my own, you know. <laughs> I remember my tagline was a helping hand for your marketing needs. Looking back, I'm like, oh, that's so cheesy. <laughs> yeah. I would never give that tagline to any of my clients. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you just kind of go through all that stuff. But I, I also started with nothing, and I've been in the black, you know, uh, since I started with a, you know, a nice uh, rate of growth. Um, but a couple of years ago, I had this banker, you know, on my back. You got to get a lot of credit. I'm like, I don't need it. I got, you know. No, you got a line of credit. So finally, he convinced me. I, I opened up a line of credit. And what that did to me was basically started creating this wiring of like, hey, you know what? If he's giving me a line of credit, I can probably create my own as well. So I have a double line of credit because I started stashing money away with that mentality. Yeah. And then um, 
But a couple of things, you know, like especially like at the beginning of 2016, a new regulation just got in place for business crowdfunding. And this is for micro lenders. So um, the SBA, uh, the SBAC, uh, this Small Business Advocacy Council, you know, helped it kind of get that through. But imagine it's like a like a fund, like a crowdfund, you know, uh, crowd uh, fundraising for businesses where you could say, you know what, I can give you a, a percentage of my business for 5,000, 10, 20, 30, 50,000. So that makes, allows businesses to, that are service-based to get some revenue and get some, you know, basically get some investments for some capital, you know, expenditures, even in payroll and stuff like that. And it just passed, uh, like I said, beginning in 2016. So that's another great alternative for businesses that want to get some cash in. And, um, and then of course you have, you know, for products, you have Kickstarter, which we've done quite a few campaigns uh, successfully uh, for that. And that's another great way to, you know, pre-sale and get some revenue for your products. Those are, you know, some ideas that, um, that you can do. And because I do have a product, uh, my journey was a little bit different in, in relationship to finances. Um, prior to becoming an entrepreneur, I was in education and I had excellent credit. And so the one piece of advice I would offer is that no matter what you do, protect your personal credit. Make sure that you are paying your bills on time every month if you're having challenges, do not let anything ever become late. You can make phone calls, but always meet that financial obligation, which is what I did when I was in education. As a result of doing that, um, that allowed me to have an amazing credit score. And because of that amazing, amazing credit score, I did not seek lenders. Lenders came to me um, because I needed product and I needed a lot of product and manufacturing is extremely expensive because you have to have a prototype and before you can even get a prototype you have to have CAD drawings, you have to have a variety of, of designers, um, you have to have people who actually do 3D printing and you may, ha you may have to go through that process two or three times if you're lucky. I know some people who've gone through 3D printing 10, 15, 20 times. But you do that because when you spend the money on the mold, that is dozens of thousands of dollars. So what I ended up doing was, um, first I prayed, because that's what you do sometimes as an entrepreneur. <laughs> and I said, OK, I don't know where I'm going to get this money to take care of the manufacturing. The next day, I literally got a call from my bank that I'd had an amazing relationship with for over 20 years. And they said, hey, you know, we recognize you've been a wonderful customer. We'd like to offer you a line of personal credit. And I looked at my phone. I'm like, what? And they're <laughs> like, yeah. And, and so I, I thought this was a joke. I hung up the phone. I called the bank back. And I didn't tell them that, you know, I didn't get the person's number that I'd, I'd previously spoken to. And I said, I think someone called, but I want to make sure this is not a scam, this is not you know, fishing. This is what I was told. Different representative from my bank said, no, we recognize you've been an amazing customer. We really do want to offer you this money. I said, yes. <laughs> and so that is how I was able to, to satisfy what I needed to satisfy in order to get manufacturing completed. I did look at investors, and I actually had investors to seek me out. I did not choose to go with the investor because, again, you have to understand what your why is. And I realized that if I had s taken the advice of the investors initially, um, they wanted my business to grow in a direction that was about increasing revenues for them. It had, n had very little to do with my passion, my purpose, my mission for this particular product. So, I weighed the two. I chose my own personal financing initially. Um, and now that I'm in the business and, and I have a little bit more experience, I can now talk to the right kinds of investors for me. Because there are hundreds of kinds of investors. Um, there are some that really want to promote your company, your ideas. There are others that want the dividends, they want the revenue so that they can 
push you to sell your idea so that they can make money. No matter what institution that you choose to go with, you have to do your research to make sure that you're comfortable with, with whoever you're working with. Whoever you are working with, it's a marriage. It's a relationship. It's a commitment. You can't just break up with them because you no longer like them. You really have to understand what you are getting into and the type of person that you're going to be working with. Good stuff. I, a common theme that I'm hearing from, from everyone here on our panel is that, you know, you don't necessarily have to have that investor or a loan to get your business started. Here at the College of DuPage, we talk a lot about, you know, bootstrapping it on your own. You know, the media paints and, and Shark Tank paint the picture of you need that investor, you need all that money to get started. And that's just not always the case, as is evidence of, of our panel right here as well. So Technology also affords us the opportunity. Jackie mentioned, you know, there's crowdfunding sources out there that weren't available when I was most of you guys' age here. Crowdfunding, Kickstarter, there's, there's opportunities to be able to do it if you have to go that route. Yes, sir. Yeah, no, I just uh, want to make a comment. I mean, there's uh, the way for you to be profitable in business is either, you know, it's the gap between the expenses and the, the gross yeah. revenue, right? Yeah. And, and that difference is the profit. Yeah. So, one other way to consider that, I actually hired an intern out of Aurora University, and she started working with us, and she started allowing me to expand my wings and, and, and really manage other clients, bring in that revenue that, you know, that we needed to kind of grow. And from there, we had three to four people, and when she came on board with her talents, I mean, and it wasn't in the form of somebody injecting money, but you know, we were able to work something out so that she can join us and help us out. We grew to 12 people within a year. And uh, she's been with us for now four years. And uh, I just offered her a part of my business. She's 26, and she's now a partner of a full service, award-winning marketing agency. And I have a vetting plan for her in place to retain her over the next five years, where I give her more equity in my business. And then we can use that to create other businesses, like my publishing company and other, other stuff, other investments that we're considering. You know? But that's another way to. To do that. I don't, you know, I don't know. This isn't for everybody, but I, I heard Spike Lee interviewed one time, and I think he started his first film using credit cards. You know, he, he yeah. it's not it's, everybody's threshold of risk is different, right? But um, regardless, when you when you're trying to get money, you're going to have to tell a story. And one thing I did learn in journalism was story sticks, facts fade. Mm -hmm. So if people, if they like your story, they remember your story. It's going to be what, what makes a difference. And whether you can sell that banker across the table from you on giving you a loan, or whether you can bring in a, a partner to collaborate on something. Questions from the audience? Anybody else got a question? Yes, sir, this distinguished gentleman over here. Wait for the mic. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> hey, so I have, I'm so inspired by your stories. I just love them. I love that stuff. And I'm really inspired by this audience. I, I see so many future entrepreneurs here. So many students that, uh, you know, the future's ahead of you, so that's cool. By the way, quick question for Peter James. Does anyone here go to the Entrepreneurship Club? Awesome. Good, good, good. Let's give that's them a hand, yes. <laughs> I want to ask you if, uh, if anyone has a favorite tool online, and I want to share one that I have. When I want to schedule an appointment with someone, I just send them a link to my calendar and they could pick the appointment. And then I really like that they get an email in the morning. Hey, you have an appointment at 3 o'clock, you know, first thing. And then 30 minutes before that appointment, they get a text. It makes me look really important. But it's just something I set up a while ago. Um, What's the tool? So a product that, productivity tool that you that may use. There's two of them. The studies will say that the average emails back and forth are seven times. How about these times? No, those don't work. How about that? You know, all that stuff. Just here's my link to schedule. It's done. The two popular ones are schedulonce.com, and then Calendly, Calend, and then ly.com. Those are the two really popular. They're very inexpensive, save you a bunch of time. But anyway, do you have any favorite tools that you like to use? Yeah, any productivity tools, not necessarily even scheduling, just in general. What do you use that really helps your business develop? Yes, Mel? I run uh, my two companies on Trello. Oh, Trello, yeah. Trello, yeah. yeah. Trello rocks the world. What is Trello? Trello is an online project management system that is very visual. 
and you sort of plug in your process and then you take the cards and everything associated with that task is in the back end of the card and you can assign, you can, you know, it's really amazing. I run, you know, we have 14, 15 people now and you just like, I can log on my phone and I can see exactly what's going on even if I'm presenting today. Like I can, the activity is happening. And I also, over the years, I've also created my own, uh, I, I call it the Make It Happen Journal. And it's really a productivity tool to help you visualize and, and really set up for success for the next following week. And uh, that's a product that, you know, I'm always developing products and stuff. So that's a product that I just developed um, like a couple of months ago over my 10, 15 years of you know, learning all these different things, like how do you become, how do you manage two businesses and a nonprofit and a family? And, <laughs> and then I also am a pilot, so, so I fly, you know, and every time I'm at the airport, I'm like three hours of my time, you know, I'm like no phones, I can't text and fly. So I'm like, <laughs> then I go back, I'm like, I still gotta get my stuff done, you know, so it just kind of helps. It's good stuff, someone else. Salesforce. Oh. New Salesforce, love it. Yeah, I mean, anybody wants to pick up community service hours to help us with that, we could use. <laughs> Just saying. I've, I've used uh, Calendly in the back of the day. I've used X.ai. Um, there's a lot of great stuff. I'm a big fan of handwritten lists. Uh, I know it's, it's hokey, but uh, there's, there's the act of actually writing things down, starting from the top, going from the bottom, checking it off. Uh, you do it when you're, in, 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 you're six years old. You do it now. Um, it makes sense for whatever reason. I remember it more. And I run a technology company, I still do it handwritten lists. I still have the pad of paper, so I still do it that way every single day. And it's just rituals. And I think that's whatever it is for you. I mean, if it's a spreadsheet, if it's a Google Doc, if it's a, <coughs> if it's a handwritten list, if it's Calendly that makes it work for you, that's awesome. I mean, just the moment that you build a habit uh, and make that work, I think that's the idea. And the thing is just being consistent on that habit. So that's my thought. Uh, yeah, I just want to say really, what you said about ritual and lists are really yeah. important. Um, I think the Four Seasons is one of the top hotels in the country. Every morning when they have their, their five-minute meeting to get everybody rolling, they all sit down and they go over the, what their, their culture and their ritual is all about. I mean, today, I mean, maybe they have 20 different values or whatever you want to call them. And, and today is Monday. So Monday we're going to talk about make sure you take that client and you bring them all the way to the end result and make sure that's a good result. You know, that might be the, for the day. So everybody goes out, whether it's a bartender or a manager. Mm -hmm. And it becomes ritual, it becomes habit. It's why we go to church, right? It's right. why, you know what I mean? It's reinforcing that. So, yeah. Beautiful thing. Good stuff. Good stuff. Somebody else? Use. I use Excel. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I keep it simple. I, I, uh, I, I don't have the, the, the capital to go buy programs. I'm very comfortable with Excel. I know how to use it, and I already have it. So, for right now, with what I'm doing, it actually works. Uh, eventually, I'll probably move on to something else if I need it, but uh, I, I, have, I have a tool that. And you know, as crazy as that sounds, so many programs, productivity tools, have started with an Excel and then grown to different platforms. So that's just like the baseline for a lot of these productivity tools that we're talking about. So kudos to you. Hope you know how to do the formulas and everything too? I do. I finally figured out pivot table, so that's it. I'm good now. Wow, good for you. <laughs> I have somebody to connect you with that loves Excel. Like, Excel. Like, <laughs> so having a product again. It's a little bit different for me. And um, what I had to first do was look at my time to see what I was spending most of my time on. Um, I am a very organized person. So I didn't necessarily need something to help me stay organized. I needed something to help me maximize the time that I was spending on my orders. And so I found this app called Odoro that actually plugged into my store, my online store, that imported information. Because previous, prior to that, I was actually getting an order, taking that information, um, using my organizational skills, putting it on the Excel spreadsheet, making sure that I could track everything, my inventory, Excel spreadsheet. But that takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So this particular app allows me to do all of that um, at a fraction of the time so that I could actually go out and do other things with my time. So whatever tool that you're using, and there are thousands, mm -hmm. maybe even millions of tools right now, choose the tool based on your need, not based on your want. You know, a lot of times we use, we take for granted our phones nowadays that it's only for social media, texting, and maybe talking. But a lot of these productivity tools that they're talking about they're mobile friendly, and I'm sure most of you use your phone more for business 
than you do even for communicating. Absolutely. Yeah. It's crazy as it sounds. More questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Wait, wait, let me, get, let me get the mic real quick. Sorry about that. Sorry. When it comes to letting go like sectors of your company, not like actual physical ones, but like responsibilities, and because I have a cleaning business, so what I do is I handle everything alone. I use um, this woman named Rosa to be like my face, so that way no one knows I'm the owner. Yeah. So that if there's like any complaints or any like like negotiating going on, they're not gonna look at me like, oh, please, like you don't have to like charge me this much. So how do you, I'm looking at getting employees to um, clean for me, because I'm a college student as well, so I don't wanna work. All right, I don't have the time to work, so I'm gonna be going to law school soon. Um, so how do you let go of little responsibilities and be comfortable with it without like micromanaging? Delegating. Yeah, so how do you delegate Ooh, without micromanaging? It's tough for an entrepreneur, so I'm dying to hear their responses. Yeah. It's, uh, it's challenging. It's, you know, I, I talked to a general one time who said, take charge and do the right thing. And I always try to do that, even when it's tough. But um, I've, had to, I've had to give, you know, I've, I've tried to delegate, because you know, you get the entrepreneurial, yeah, yeah. what is it called? It's a disease, right? <laughs> we don't want to let go of anything. Yeah. But if you can, you know, give, give a little bit of rope, but manage it, you know what I mean? Manage it and keep, keep your fingers on the pulse, because it'll get away from you really fast. And, and I've had to, you know, I've given trips away where, where my, some of my staff was running the trip and, and I just didn't like the way it was going and I, you know, I would have to take over again. And, but we have chapters around the world and, and, um, and we have to have faith, but we have to have systems and standards that people can follow and that makes it a lot easier. And um, keeping in touch, I mean, every, every touch point you have with someone, you can see where their head's at, you know what I mean? Is your employee, head, is their head in the game today? You know, are they gonna be representing you the way you want them to represent you and stuff? So, you know, it's, that's the challenging part for entrepreneurs. Uh, working with people is really tough. Uh, it kinda sucks. Um, <laughs> because it's true, because they get tired, they show up late, they, they stay late, they underproduce, they overproduce, they're the most fickle thing in your business, guaranteed. Sometimes they come in with a great attitude, sometimes they quit on you. Sometimes they, they overproduce and become you know, a, a next boss. The whole point is that they're, they're variables. And, it does, and a lot of those variables have nothing to do with you or nothing to do with your business. So if one of your employees gets married or uh, decides that they don't want to do this anymore, you still have to suffer for that. The most consistent thing that you can do, or the most, let me take a step back, the best thing you can do for your business is, is uh, you know, even out all the variables as much as possible, and then try to be consistent. If you can be consistent, you're probably going to become a millionaire, if not a, a billionaire, very quickly, because it is very difficult to maintain quality. So when you're at, to answer your question, how do you delegate, what you have to understand truly is what your level of tolerance for variables are. So I am, uh, so let's say you're doing the work yourself. Um, you're saying, let's say, for example, uh, I'm willing to accept someone to do uh, the job 80% as well as I am. Let's say that's, that's when, you know, it's reasonable. Yeah, oh, you said that? Yeah. Then you don't need me. Good. <laughs> Go up. Go forth. You've learned everything. <laughs> no, but, yeah, but yeah, 80%. And so if, you could, if that person can do about 80% of what you can do, and you say, great, then you're, I'm, I'm willing to tolerate that, because odds are you're probably doing 110, 120% of what, you, what the next person would do. And if they can maintain that level of quality and understand that threshold, then you can delegate it off. If you can't, if they cannot do that, they're not the right person, you cannot delegate that. Otherwise, you're going to uh, lose your quality, Products are going to suffer. You're going to, have to uh, you're going to hunt more and more for clients to replace your old clients, and it's never going to be. You're never going to be able to grow the business. It's always going to be a lifestyle business. Um, and what Tom said about ritual and culture is really important. You yeah. need to establish that right away with whoever you're delegating to. Mm -hmm. They have to understand and have their head in the game when they're helping you, and the, and then the systems will hopefully keep them in the fairway. Yeah. <laughs> You know what, I think there's a lot of ingredients, uh, and I've tried different things over the years. I mean, people, you're right, people are complicated. Yeah. They're complex creatures, right? And we have to deal with them, you know, and they have to deal with us too when we have a bad yeah. day. But uh, I've used a variety of things. Uh, trust is a big factor, and when you think about trust, is knowing that the other person has your best interest in mind and vice versa. And, and trust takes a lifetime to build, but sometimes it could be gone in a second. So surrounding yourself with people that you truly trust. Uh, my employees call me the dream catcher 
because I am constantly like reminding them, hey, you know, did you finish your book? Are you going to Europe this year? Are we going to make this happen this year? And they're like, wow, it's January 1st. Like you're, you know, so it's important that you, um, it, you know, facilitate the process of other people to become inspired for them to take action. I see my employees working at sometimes six o'clock in the morning and sometimes at 10 o'clock at night. And I see all the activity. I see, I don't have to say, I, I'm not a micromanager. I don't have to say when they need to come in and where they need to, you know, they just make it happen. So we always say the projects are not projects, they're missions. And when you have a mission, you want to accomplish that mission and you want to fulfill that. And sometimes it takes you five minutes, sometimes it takes you two hours. But processes and systems and technology that helps you, you know, create that continuity and that consistency is important. And, um, and then also one of the mistakes that I see, because I talk to a lot of companies, you know, and I've talked to many, many companies at, at all different levels uh, throughout the years, is that sometimes you hire the person based on them, based on who the person is. But when you can turn it around and say, you know what, I have these seats in my company for what I need to get the company to the next level. What are the key characteristics of these, the seats that I need? And then who is going to better fill those seats? So it's not based on John or Marie or you know whoever. It's based on the needs of the business to be able to create a scalability and create consistency and to be able to grow it. So it's kind of getting, you know, getting out of the the emotional part and saying, you know what, what I need to thrive is this, you know, and then just kind of finding the person that fulfills that and then being the leader that guides them and facilitates the process of inspiration. Because when people are inspired, they go over, I mean, they, they move mountains, you know, I'm, if I, I couldn't have my board for the foundation and do things internationally with the foundation if I didn't have that board that really believed in the mission and continued to fulfill that, or my publishing company, or my marketing agency, or even my family. You know, my husband and I inspire each other, and we help, you know, fulfill each other's dreams. He loves to race cars. I love to fly planes, and he just, like, supports, you know, like, and that's part of the magic. You know, I take my, my employees to Mexico for a three-day weekend. I was like, hey, you know what? I got you all set up for a spa day. She's like, wow, you do? Yep, 90 minute massage, a facial, you're set up Friday at two, at two, two, 12 o'clock. And she's like, wow, right in the middle of the day, yes. Because I appreciate, you know, and that's, that's, people go above and beyond to do that. Are you tired? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's talk. I want, I want to piggyback on that really quick. Here's a, here's a thought 90% of the people that you hire, they're not, they'll never be passionate about your company like you are. However, what I like about Jackie, she's making them more passionate about it as they continue to work for her. She's inspiring them. But, you know, think about it yourselves. When you do an application for a job, you're in it for the money. Now, you might decide over time that you are in love with your company, but until that time, you hopefully work for one of these individuals. And money is not the way to motivate people. That's not how it people really are motivated. Yeah, yeah. and and when you're when you have somebody, you know, and you're monitoring, if you think there's a problem, there's a problem. And I'm in a Vistage group, and and I, yeah. I work with a lot of CEOs that some of them really struggle with firing people who are not. You know, there's a Peter principle, right? Where I'm I'm your best salesman, but when you make me a manager, I suck. You know what I mean? I'm not a good manager of people, but I'm a great salesman. So. You know, you, you got to kind of keep your fingers, like, again, on the pulse of what's going on. And, and don't be afraid, because I see some of these, these CEOs, and they're, they're afraid. They're struggling emotionally with having to deal with someone who's a friend or, or maybe even a relative who they might have to fire or tell, you know what? But if you can position it in a way and, and move them either out of the company, you want to move them out somewhere. They either put them in a different position, or put them, or, or they go, need to go somewhere else for their for their sake, you know. And you'll be doing them a favor. I've been trying to buy a car for one of my employees for the last three years, and she always says, "No, like, no, it's okay, you know. <laughs> Give me a little bit of a race, and don't buy me the car." And I'm like, like now it's December, like. Can we buy, you know, can we get you? Because she's been so amazing. You're you know? a great boss. So, really. But, you know, she doesn't want to. <laughs> I work for you. She's not inspired by that. You know, I'm like. I need a car. Are you sure? Angela, you were. I need your car. You were saying? Yes. <laughs> so I, everything that, that you've heard that you've been told is it absolutely applies. Um, you know your company. You know what the workforce is like. You know what the job entails. Hire the right person for what you need, for what the position requires. And do not settle. 
do not put a body in the position because you just need someone, because you're going to have higher turnover if that's what you're doing. The other part of it is, if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. Sure. If you tell someone, ask someone, create wonderful expectations for someone, but those expectations have never been written, you've never had a conversation about a tool that you've created to express what the expectations are, um, if you don't have a, a, an, an employee handbook or, or some form of written accountability, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, for you to ensure that the standards and the procedures that you want to create can be um, followed in the manner in which you follow them. I'm an employee of one. So I'm not actually even at the, at the, at the position where you're at yet. Um, but I will tell you, based on 20 years of experience being around people every day, uh, it, it's what they said. Uh, there's, there's variables in the spectrum. But you've got to just establish the bookends. And you establish the culture. You can't delegate. You can delegate responsibility for things, but you can't delegate uh, the overall responsibility and the accountability of your, of your company. So it's your, it's your name, your reputation. So at the end of the day, you have to be comfortable with that individual uh, of what you're going to do. But I would say absolutely set it up, the expectations from the beginning. Uh, but I would say give it a, give it a spectrum. Don't say it's got to be this way. Or, you know, try to give them a window, and, and most people will, 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 will fulfill that. We have time for one more question, and since I'm the moderator here, I'm going to ask it. Oh, <laughs> and then actually, we're gonna, I'm going to hand the baton over to Paul in a little bit to have, for his little announcement. Uh, and I actually ask this question a lot of times to entrepreneurs who come visit the Entrepreneurship Club. So uh, knowing then what you know now, you're seeing these college students out here, and you all have this wisdom, this infinite wisdom with you that you take with you day to day in your activities and your, uh, in your businesses. What would you tell your old self if you were sitting where these individuals are sitting here now? You know, let's start with you, yes, sir. I, I actually wish I, I did something like this even three months ago. Uh, I, am, I have already learned more probably in the last hour uh, than I've probably learned over the past two months. Uh, struggling, struggling kind of on my own with a little bit of assistance, but in terms of, so I would say definitely start networking early and talk to people, get out of your comfort zone. Uh, I, don't, I don't like to go up to people I don't know and just start having conversations, but get out of your comfort zone and, and, and do what you need to do to learn uh, because there is a wealth of knowledge that you're going to, you get more, I, I've learned that I have learned more from other people necessarily than I have from a textbook. So I would tell my younger self, Definitely continue to network and learn from other people that, uh, in other words, find somebody that's a role model or, hey, I want to be like that person, and then go interact with people like that person so that you can actually become that person. Uh, I would say build your network right now. Uh, you're in college. You know a lot of people. You're getting in engaged with, like, hundreds of people, thousands of people. Build it right now. After we're done with this, contact every single one of us. Put us, put us on your LinkedIn. Do it. Yeah. Be exploitive. Email us, talk to everyone that you can, and uh, to steal a little bit of Jim's uh, MO, uh, you know, ask uh, constantly for feedback, and insight, thoughts, coffee, call, do everything that you can. The hustle matters. Um, so you have to be willing to go out there and put yourself out there. Uh, if, even if you're an introvert, uh, I was an introvert. I am not uh, someone who's naturally up on stage. It's actually, I was just telling PJ, uh, I was terrified. You're doing great, man. Well, I'm all right. 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 <laughs> But uh, I'm, not, I'm not someone who comes out there. I forced myself to do this. Uh, I did it because I had, um, when I graduated from college, I had six jobs in five years. Uh, I was constantly getting fired or getting promoted and quitting or both. It's like a race to the door. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but I realized I was just not made to uh, work for other people. And it took me a long time to be like, I can't really get fired again. I really need to make some, <laughs> do something here. Uh, and then Dominic and I were starting to figure out what we wanted to do. But uh, it, it forced me to do things like you're doing, step out of your comfort zone, and do things that are a little bit more risk-taking. So that would be my encouragement. Build a network. And uh, building that network means that you have to be a little bit of introvert uh, to go to extrovert mode. People love to talk about themselves. Yeah, so when I was the ad sales manager at Northern Illinois University, I started calling ad agencies downtown and media companies and going, you know what, I want to be the best damn ad manager in college. 
can do you have somebody <laughs> I can talk to there? And and you know what? I was invited downtown to lunch at, 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 with the Sun Times and Leo <laughs> Burnett and, and J. Walter Thompson and stuff. And so, you know, and now I have networks. Right now I'm in college and I'm building a network, like you were just saying. Yeah. Also, when I'm about to take people with disabilities underwater on life support, I, rem I remind my team it's all about adapting. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all about thinking outside the box. Situational awareness is very important underwater, but it is in, in, in everyday life, yeah, too. Is. You know, keep your eyes open. You know, keep your head in the game. That's really important. And um, you can have the best product in the world, and if you can't sell it, it doesn't mean anything. So you need to think about how you're going to be able to do that, build that into your culture and, and stuff. So, If you would have told me that uh, at the age of 34, A, I was going to be alive, B, I was going to have 10 books and businesses and this and the foundation and traveling the world and building a center in Mexico and all these magical things that are happening in my life, I probably wouldn't have believed you. And uh, if I were in your shoes today, the very first thing that I would do is I would believe in myself. Because I have found that over the years, the, the force and the sustainable energy that has created all those things and opened up those doors has been the energy that has emanated and has inspired people around me like a magnet. And they've opened up their doors. They've opened up their homes. And if people sometimes, they don't remember my name, but they met me 14 years ago at a luncheon. They say, I remember your energy. <laughs> you know, I never forgot your energy, right? So it's how do you show up? And in and, and, and doing that, what are you doing to take care of yourself today, to be the best version of you? Because you know what? Even if I showed up to do my finals here with a, a bag and a tube coming down to nobody knew. Nobody knew that I was fighting for my life two weeks prior to that, right? And I showed up, and I always show up to give the best version of myself with the best energy, with the best intentions. And I can guarantee you that if you do that in every interaction and you create encounters rather than transactions with the people you're communicating with on a daily basis, your life will be completely transformed and you will achieve that that you're seeing and even more things that beyond your wildest dreams, like, like what everything that happens to me on a daily basis. And I'm, sometimes I come home like with tears, like, oh my God, you're not gonna believe what happened to me. Like, you know, it's amazing. And that's, it all comes from within. So believe in yourself and live a mean, meaningful life and uh, enjoy every moment because it's amazing and magical. <laughs> well, I would say be courageous and following your intuition. Being an entrepreneur is wonderful. It's exciting. Sometimes it's scary. But every day, you have to find some courage to get up and do your job. And being an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur is your job. And the things that frighten you and the things that scare you are probably the things that you should be doing. I am an introvert as well. And as a result of being an introvert, there are some things that do not come as easy for me. Social media is not one of the things that is easy for me. But I know social media is good for me. As a result of that, I courageously look at my Facebook account now that I have one, which is about six months old. <laughs> I courageously look at this Facebook account and I courageously interact with people. And I cannot follow the script that everyone else creates regarding you should say this in social media and you should say this in social media. Instead, I follow my, tu my intuition and my intuition tells me that I need to be understanding of people's challenges, their issues. I need to be compassionate. And as a result of doing that, it has promoted my business more so than anything that I ever would have done had I followed someone's script. So again, have the courage, accept the courage, and follow your intuition. <laughs>